We are third in the nation in the number of community college students. Who, I know many of you work with transfers, and uh, we are third in the nation in the number of students who go from community college to universities and graduate with four-year degrees. Our community college system, in terms of students who start full-time, uh, is fourth in the nation in the number of students who actually end up with a certification or degree after three years. So I, I could go on and on and I won't, but, but basically this is a good system of higher education and we don't need to be about the business of dismantling it. We need to be supporting it and providing support to our system across. And as you know, at the Illinois Board of Higher Education, we work with private colleges, we work with public colleges, we work with all sectors, two and four years. And we have the data and we know all of this and we're really doing our best, I can assure you, to assure our folks in the legislature that uh, this is a system worth investing in. Now, there are some things we need to address, and many of the things you're doing here tonight are designed to address those very needs. When I came to Illinois in 2014, many of you who maybe have been around for a while know that in 2009, Illinois adapted, uh, adopted something called the Public Agenda for College and Career Success. And it really was, it set the goal of 60% of all Illinoisans in the workforce having a high quality college credential by 2025. That's our North Star, that's our Holy Grail, whatever other metaphor you want to use. And it has some sub-goals underneath it, keep, keep it affordable, you know, serve workforce needs, uh, support economic development. When I came in 2014, we did an, in my very first meeting with the Illinois Board, we enlisted some really smart data people, many of whom would help create the first report, to do a, a five years later report, to look at how we're doing, and how are we doing. I mean, it doesn't do any good to set a plan and set goals if you don't track how you're doing. And what we found was some good news. Illinois went from 40 to 43 percent of its population with a high quality two and four year college degree. We know this year, the most recent data shows we're up to 44. And we also have about 6% of our population with a high quality certificate, industry recognized certification or certificate that actually has at least a $10,000 bump in the labor market. We don't count things just because people hand out pieces of paper. We count them if they really have impact on the students' lives. So we're, at, we're basically at 50%. So we've been making some progress. But underneath that, there are some troublesome pieces. And this led my board to set certain priorities that I think give us an opportunity to work carefully with, with work with you all and the work you're doing uh, around first generation and low income students to help us meet our needs. So here's some things we found that weren't such good news. The gaps for uh, people of color uh, in, in the overall Illinois population were growing. So we were getting more educated, but we were leaving Hispanics, uh, African Americans, and others behind at a faster rate. <coughs> Affordability in Illinois of college, back to your scholarship, Affordability of college in Illinois, this is a little bit of a complicated phrase, so I'll say it slowly. Illinois became less affordable faster. Less affordable faster for middle and low income families. And that's two and four year colleges became less affordable faster over that five year period, 2009 to 2014, than all but five or six other states in the union. As I like to say, you can get them ready, you can get them motivated, but if they can't pay the toll, they can't get on the interstate. So we, we have, so affordability is a huge challenge for us. Another area, and you, you mentioned your new member, who I know focuses on this, but and some of you may want to focus on it, some of you may not, but we have a massive number of adults in Illinois already out there in the workforce who lack a college degree. In fact, 22% of our workforce out there in Chicago, when you leave here tonight, if you walk past five people, likely one of them will be someone with what we call some college and no degree meaning they went to one of our institutions and didn't finish. We've got to find a pathway to get them back because we're not keeping up with other states and getting those folks back, and they're a key part of our workforce development campaign. But there are a lot of things we're doing despite the budget impasse that I think are opportunities with partnership with this wonderful sector and the many students that you serve. The fact that you are zeroing in on mentoring programs and on uh, working with first generation and low income students, that's the gap issue. Uh, at the center of it. Uh, you can be a partner with us in that. We are working with uh, John Comerford, who's here, who's the president of somewhere, of uh, Blackbird. Uh, oh, where, oh uh, well, anyway, he was here. Uh, uh, is on our commission for the future of the workforce, where we have uh, funds to go into regions of Illinois, working with you and your other private partners, college partners and public, and two-year and four-year, to better align our work to pre prepare students 
for the emerging workforce needs in those regions. And let me say something at this point, because I know a lot of you are liberal arts, and I came from a liberal arts college. And you know, my good friend uh, Michael Barber, Sir Michael Barber, who worked with Tony Blair in England to do the big reforms in England, used to say that the path that education held is paved with false dichotomies. <laughs> and, and one of those false dichotomies, in my mind at least, is the liberal arts versus career. Where, where we pit ourselves as if those are in opposition to one another. When in fact, all the corporate people in here, I was just at Quad Cities, uh, they're launching a regional initiative that we're going to support up there. And in their meeting, a third of the people there were corporate folks, Alcoa, John Deere, and others. And they know that what you want, you certainly want people who have uh, skills and abilities in the areas that they're architecture or medical science or whatever area they're going into, but you also want people who are analytic, who can problem solve, who can communicate effectively with an increasingly diverse and global market of consumers as well as an increasingly diverse workforce in their own organizations. You want people who understand history, who understand how change occurs, and who are excited by the opportunity of change and not scared into stability by the, by the specter of change. These are the kinds of educated people we want in our, in our, in our, in our, in our workforce. And, and, and so it is so important that we think about how we blend these and do these in a way in the interest of students that prepare them not for a job, but for a career going forward. My son is graduating from college next week, and I will be down there. And I just talked to him the other day, and he's just freaked out, frankly, about, uh, you know, like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I said, Dylan, that's not the decision you're making. I said, you will have 15 jobs over the next week. You're just trying to figure out what the next step is, and then you'll stand there for a while, and then you'll figure out what the next step is. So don't think you're, like, plotting your life here. Uh, but you have gotten a straight, the College of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, you know, Somebody has to live there in college. <laughs> it's a tough job, as I told you, somebody's got to do it. Uh, I have to tell you this quick side story. When, when he was there the first year and I was still at the Lumen Foundation in Indianapolis, I texted him because we only communicate by text. And, uh, and I said, Are you coming home for spring break? And he's a bit of a smart aleck and he texted me back and said, Dad. He said, most students in spring break go where it's warm and there's an ocean. I am already there. So, so we thought about that. He made perfect sense. So I took a vacation. We went to Charleston. <laughs> but, but again, the 24 colleges that you have, the many students you're serving, the emphasis of this organization on scholarships first, for first-generation students, tackling the affordability question. But I would tell you, if we're really going to tackle the affordability question, it's a both-and argument. And I've said this. I had the privilege of speaking before the entire Illinois Senate, Committee of the Whole. I've said this in front of other committees. The solution for Illinois is a both-and solution. It is both the state stepping up and doing what it needs to do to stabilize investment in its higher education system. And if there, there may not be any silver bullets in life, but creating a more educated population is the closest thing to a silver bullet you get for raising per capita income, lowering health care costs, lowering criminal justice costs, lowering public assistance costs, and making your state a prosperous state. Uh, and so, but there's that. And then there's also all of us on the other side, on the, what I would call the supply side, if I could call it that, who need to be thinking about how do we contain costs? How do we be most effective? How do we, we're going to release a report within the next month that's going to show 10-year spending trends in Illinois higher education. We will be able to identify the cost drivers. We will be able to have conversations about how to contain those costs, just the way every business person in this room constantly looks at their costs and figure out how, figures out how to contain them. And then we will be able to do our part to improve student outcomes and contain our costs and, and stay as affordable as we can. It's a both-and solution, both in terms of public commitment to higher education. And the public commitment to higher education is to both the public sector and the private sector. I mean, math is, of course, the most classic example. But there are so many ways in which we need to be working together to ensure that we are enrolling and graduating those students who are suffering from our gaps, those adults who are not getting a pathway back to college, and make it affordable so they can pay the toll and not leave with crippling debt at the end of the process so they can be a contributing member of our society. And if we do that, we will all be better off. I conclude with uh, one of my favorite books that I've read in the last couple of years is a book called Future Perfect by Stephen Johnson. And it's a wonderful book, and I won't go into all the, it's, it's thin, you can read it like in two nights. 
Uh, but, uh, but one of the things that Stephen Johnson talks about at the beginning of the book is that in this country, uh, the United States of America is known for its pragmatism. In fact, the only decent school of philosophy we've ever produced was produced by folks just down the road here at the University of Chicago. Uh, John Dewey, Robert Park, W.I. Thomas called the pragmatism, right? And we have a history of progressive movements that have made a difference in the lives of people all over this country. But, Stephen argues that uh, blame the media, it's always good to blame the media whenever you can, but blame whoever you want, but we've sort of entered this era where we think it's all about miracles and heroes, not progressive long-term commitment to change. And so, you know, there are people I've talked to who think, you know, President, President Obama was supposed to turn everything around. He was supposed to be that hero. Uh, Martin Luther King is the civil rights movement. No. That started decades before. Rosa Parks was trained in North Carolina. She knew how to do the bus boycott. I mean, it, it, it doesn't work that way. And the best example he has in the book that I, is, is, how many of you have heard of the Miracle on the Hudson? Everybody, everybody, right? So, right, Miracle, who's the hero? The pilot. The pilot, Captain Tell. So, but here's the truth of the matter, as Stephen Johnson tells it, and I've checked with some of my aviation program colleagues in Illinois, and they seem to think this is right. Long before that, in the 90s and before, in the aviation industry, there was a recognition, if you'll remember, there was a time when we weren't as safe as we are now. We're in an unprecedented, knock on wood for those of us who travel, we're in an unprecedented era of public aviation safety. And what happened was they, they went back when we, we had more planes crashing into the ground and catching fire and landing in the ocean, and they said, what is causing this? And they, you know, we always say the first step to change is confront the brutal facts, confront where you are. Well, their facts were really brutal. I mean, bodies and pieces of bodies and planes crashing. And they said, what's causing this? And they worked for years, thousands and thousands of people in the aviation industry, engineers and others, worked to figure out that problem. And it's more complicated than what I'm going to present it to you, but two things they discovered was the engines were improperly structured. They caught fire too easily and they shattered too easily. So when an engine caught fire or blew up, it, it, it flew apart, pieces of the engine sheared the plane, etc. They also found that the, uh, the, uh, the, the system that kept the plane on track, the, 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 the aviation system, was too fragile. It went out too easily. So the captain didn't have any way to know what was happening with the plane. So they worked and they worked. It took a long time, thousands of them, and they fixed it. So when those birds hit that plane over the Hudson, the plane didn't catch fire. It didn't blow up. It just stopped. And when Captain Scully, I'm not taking anything away from the skills of the crew and the captain, but when he was landing the plane, his system was still in operation. He could see whether he was level or not. He could see whether he was tilt. You know, you've seen those History Channel things with plane crashes where the, 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 the wing hits first and then the whole plane kind of does that spiraling thing. He knew he was flat. So the reason those people are alive today in large part is because lots of people came together with a common commitment to a common problem and they save lives. I can guarantee you that if we come together in Illinois around this education issue and we bring more and more of the students we've been leaving, leaving behind, adult and traditional, to college degrees, good degrees that prepare them for careers in a 21st century changing economy, we will save many more lives than they saved on that plane. And that's why what we're doing is so exciting and so important, and while we can't let anything stop us, budget impasse or whatever. Thanks again for having me.